Good morning, everybody. So nice to have you here. Isn't it nice? I mean, not a lot of dust being stirred, but a lot of ground being turned. That is so good to see. I know some of you, your hearts and minds are thinking what has to be done. We're really glad that you're here today. And we are praying that the planting season progresses well with safety as, good, as well as good success. It's always important to know why we are here. We come here not to be stirred, although it's all right to be stirred. It's not to be moved emotionally, although it's all right to be moved emotionally. But I think this story illustrates the point I'm making. You probably read it on the internet, but let me read it to you. A homeless man's funeral, a touching bagpipe story. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at the pauper cemetery in the middle of backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost, and being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and a crew left, and they were eating lunch. I really felt bad about being so late and apologized to the men. I went to the side of the grave and looked down, and the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather around. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family or friends. I played like I had never played before for this homeless man. And as I, play, as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept. I wept. We all wept together. When I finished and packed up my bagpipes and started for my car, though my head was low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I've never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for over 20 years. Well, we hope that you're stirred today. We hope that emotionally that you are charged. But of course, the main reason we're here, it's really a twofold purpose, isn't it? It's to worship the Lord, to lift up his name, to be reminded, to rejoice together about the work that he's done for us. And then, of course, we say, Lord, oh, I'm not worried about my neighbors. I'm asking that you would teach me that you would make me ready to serve this next week. Hey, Daniel, come on up. Let's get it started. Did you pick a good song? I First hope one? So. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. so. Well, good morning. We are going to start this morning. We, we do this one often, but I, this song today, the shout to the Lord. And um, in Sunday school, we've been talking about Israel and their, and their journey through the desert. And today we talked about, it's really a lot more than I can share up here, but just how God provided for the Israelites in the desert when there was, there was nothing, but he provided, even though they didn't know what was around the next curve, they didn't know what was around the next mountain, they didn't know if they were going to have, you know, they, they couldn't see water, they couldn't see food, they couldn't see, um, they couldn't see, they didn't know, but he provided faithfully every single day. And so we talked about a tree this morning, the acacia tree, and just how it um, provided, you know, a shade. It provided healing, provided food for camels. Uh, interesting fact, an acacia tree makes like a little, really looked like a little helicopter um, that you would see around here. And a kilo of those, I don't know what a kilo is. I don't know how big that is or how small that is. But a kilo of those would feed a camel for a week. It would sustain a camel for a week. Now, I know a kilo is not very big, but for it to sustain a camel for a week is huge. He provided food for that. That tree provided... Um, firewood and it was the tree that they used the wood they used to build the ark uh, of the covenant and it's just just to see how God provided and provides from the same thing what each one of us need in a certain time may not be the same thing that it provides for someone in another part of their uh, their journey their desert journey or their um, wherever they're at so just to know that God is the provider he's the healer he's the refuge he's all of those things um, we, as you stand, we shout to the Lord, we praise him, we thank him for his power and his majesty.
Father, Lord, we, um, we are thankful for the promises that you've given us. And Lord, we can always make a promise, but to know that you are a God, the only one who can keep every single promise. Lord, we know that you are faithful in that. We know that you are faithful to provide, um, no matter the circumstance, no matter the need. Lord, when we trust you, you provide a way, and we thank you for that. We thank you for this day for everyone that's here, for all of us as a family to get together, a family of God, to sing to you, to worship you. Lord, for who you are, for what you have done, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Greeted neighbors, you're being seated this morning. I just butt in, Andy. Sure. I forgot to tell Andy two important things, and I'm going to let you pray about them. One is, if you see Emily Mangelsdorf over here, do not hug her. She had surgery on... Wednesday, uh, appendix happened that fast, and she is bouncing back, so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, Beth, just got a word. I mentioned to you at the beginning of the first service that Ron Gundram was at uh, Woodlawn. They thought it appeared to be a stroke, at least something affecting the left side. They have transferred him from Woodlawn to... Right now, in the process, Lutheran. To Lutheran and... Fort Wayne. So that obviously tells us that there's something serious. So if you'll pray for that when it's Mm -hmm. time. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It is good to see everybody here this morning. I know it's a busy weekend for a lot of parents with with the graduations going on. And again, we congratulate all the graduates in here. I think Mackenzie's down there. Mark, good job. Um, Mark, he's worked uh, at my station for Oh, a couple. Did you work there a couple summers or not? But Mark's a good kid, hard worker. So you'll do all right, Mark. And I'm sure you'll do good too, McKenzie. <laughs> so, and then I think we visited Lauren, but she's not here. And then I think we got some uh, college graduates. Andrew, you got to go to work tomorrow, don't you? <laughs> all right. Good deal. Yep. Fun starts now. 
your rent payment probably went up too, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> no. So congratulations to all those guys and our surrounding uh, other graduates as well. We'll go through our bulletins here real quick. Let me get these uh, thank you cards out of the way. That way I don't forget them. Um, we have one here that says, Dear Church Family, Thank you for remembering me in your thoughts and prayers. Life would be scary if we didn't have the assurance that God is with us and will help us when we ask him to. Please keep praying. I still have more tests to do and a specialist to see, and that is love, Kathleen Arthur. So keep her in your prayers. And this is a thank you for, um, it says, church family, thank you for faithfully Praying for Diane and I through the, the past years of our mother's illness. Our dad was amazed at how many came through the, the viewing line telling him that they go to church with his daughters. In Christian love and forever grateful, that's Jim, Diane, and Gary, Don, Donna and David, and Rob and Amy. And that's the Nyla and Easter Day family. So continue to pray for each of those. And again, for uh, those two made this morning, we'll run through our bulletins here real quick. See you meeting next week for those of you that's on a committee. I see there's a uh, the shoe box has some items that they're needing. So uh, keep uh, read through that and keep note of that. Next Saturday, men's second Saturday men's breakfast, seven o'clock. Guys, be there. A lot of good eating and a lot of good fellowship time. So if you can attend that, by all means, try to do that if you can. VBS is coming up quick, so make note of that announcement. Uh, volunteer sign up is in the lobby. It must be that big bulletin board back there that's outside their doors there. And then registration is available online, so that'll make it pretty easy to sign your children up for VBS and, and to be a helper. Keep note of the meal train. Let's see. And then also on the back, there's a lot of uh, people on our prayer list, so keep them in your prayers. Are there any announcements from the floor? If not, we'll have our ushers come forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this day, Lord, for this time that we could be here to worship you and to praise you, a mighty and a holy God that you are, Lord, a God who has made each one of us, given us life, Lord. Help us to live for you, to serve you, and to honor you in everything that we do in this life, Lord. And Lord, as a church, I pray that you will help us to be loving to our community, to serve you, and Lord, for each of us to be able to use our talents and abilities that you've given us to honor you with them, Lord. And for our prayer list this morning, Lord, um, we think of Emily, that you continue to help her to recover. And for Ron, Lord, that um, you would be with him as he's being moved to an, another hospital and that um, he would have the care that he needs. And Lord, for those in our prayer list that are suffering from illnesses, those dealing with with the death of a loved one, Lord, we ask that you comfort hearts and give the guidance and direction that you would, would have them, Lord, to have. And for us, Lord, again, we're thankful for the way you meet our needs and you provide for us. You've given us a great country to live in, Lord. We ask that you be with our nation. Help our nation, Lord, to make good choices, to make you the center of everything that we do, to, to build society upon the upon your word, Lord, that we can continue to be blessed. I ask that, Lord, that as we give back a portion to what you've given to us, help us, Lord, to give with glad hearts and the monies be used to further your kingdom through the world and in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I heard a song on the radio and it keeps going through my head and, you know, more and more and I find myself singing it around the house. I don't know if you do that. But um, can't get it out of my head, and it's probably a good thing because it's a good song. And uh, there's so many things I could probably say about the song that probably best not to say anything at all. Hopefully the, the words speak to you as much as they've spoken to me. I am not what I make, I am who you have made me to be. 
I am not what I've done, I am loved unconditionally. I am not loved by the measure of the love that I bring. I am not who I know, I am known by the King of all kings. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, you are enough for me. With nothing, I still have everything. Jesus, you are enough for me. You are maker made visible, holding the world in your hand. You are patient and merciful, giver of grace without end. Satisfied simply by being who you've always been. You are infinite love and you prove it again and again. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, you are enough for me. With nothing, I still have everything. Jesus, you are enough for me. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, you are enough for me. With nothing, I still have everything. Jesus, you are enough for me. In you I am created. In you I am sustained. With you I'm resurrected. You overcame the grave. I stand in victory Now what else could I need With you I want for nothing Jesus my everything Jesus you are enough Jesus you are enough for me With nothing I still have I still have everything With nothing I still have everything Oh, Jesus, you are enough for me Thanks, Kevin. If you would stand with us, in my heart there rings a melody. And um, when, we, when we learn and when we figure out that Jesus is enough, when we figure out that we have to have and should have, and what, we do, what happens when we put our complete um, faith, trust, and we completely depend on him, there's a melody within us. There's a song that, that wells up inside of us because we know that because we can't do it on our own, that he's done it, that there's, there's no other melody, there's no other song, there's no other thing that's sweeter than that. We'll sing three verses. a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody.
rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Twill be my endless theme in glory. To angels I will sing. It'll be a song with glorious harmony when the chords of If you're able to remain standing, redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it in every moment of every day. We realize, when we realize that, um, that we are redeemed, that what our destination, that what we were, what we were going to be, um, that we deserve um, death and everything that's not life and everything that's not um, a presence with God, when we realize that we've been bought back into life, We've been brought out of death. We've been brought out of that and into eternal life with Christ, with God, with, for eternity, forever and ever. Um, what a great feeling and what a great thought. And we sing because we're redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. seated kids second grade and younger not younger second grade to four four year old I think yeah anyway yeah and that is this year's sec this is a confusing time of year isn't it because most of them are thinking they're third graders but we still have you as second graders for a little bit Next week, if our seniors are able to be here, if not in the weeks that they are with us, we'll be giving them a Bible from the church. But for our seniors this year, this is graduation Sunday. Now, if you've looked through the notes a little bit, you see some statistics and you might think, oh no, this is going to be one of those messages where we talk about how bad teenagers are. How many feel better when we have messages like that? It is not that kind of a message, all right? So we'll get to that in a little bit. But it is a really serious message. We've been walking through time as our Savior has been working through his public ministry, his public presentation. He's been, by way of his miracles, proving to the people of Israel, I am the Messiah you have been expecting. I mean, his miracles have gone from just little things being done in private to the raising of the dead. <clears throat> everybody in the town, everybody in the nation is talking about Jesus. They're even whispering about him in the palaces and wondering what is really important to this guy. He seems to talk about a lot of different things. He talks about the kingdom that is to come. And now he's talking about going to Jerusalem. He's even predicting his own death. 
More than that, he's predicting his burial and his resurrection. So we are now in the last year of his public ministry. Christ is now focusing on a number of important topics. This is one of those topics that's mentioned more than once. I mean, it's understandable that Jesus would preach a similar message in one community and then go and preach it at the next community as well. But it's apparently a topic that he spoke of often. <clears throat> so let's take a look at it. Today's Bible Bank. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The disciples were believing that Jesus would be the sitting king on a throne, and they wanted to make sure they had their place, you know, solidified. You can imagine how Peter, James, and John must have been thinking. They have just witnessed the transfiguration, thinking, we're the only three here. It's obvious that we are the three who will be sitting on his council table, sitting there giving advice, giving advice to the Lord Jesus. That never changes, does it? We think we can do the same. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like a little child, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones to trust in me, who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. Our message today is talking about youth. You notice the title. It's kind of a strange title. It's a quote from Matthew Henry. Now, Matthew Henry lived back in the, he died in the early 1800s. <clears throat> So that tells you about the language that he uses. But isn't it a great quote? The flower of youth never appears more beautiful than when it bends towards the sun of righteousness. You know how easy it is to get on a bandwagon? <clears throat> Beth and I are beginning to get on a bandwagon. After I saw this quote talking about how encouraging it is and how inspirational it is for all of us when we see young people love the Lord, that I thought, well, obviously he's talking mostly about sunflowers, right? I mean, you remember they get up in the east and they watch the sun and the flower will turn and it'll go to the west. And then somehow at night it knows to twist itself back around and get ready for the rising sun. Sunflowers, I've decided, are pretty amazing. It's taken scientists a long time to figure out how it does it and why it knows to do it. And the, the simplified version is this. Our creator has put in certain cells that respond to the light and certain ones that respond to the day. Isn't that amazing? So when the flower is turning, those two cells are fighting and not really cooperating with each other so that the flower turns and then comes back and goes the next day time and time again. You never knew this. A bee is five times more likely to go to a sunflower than other flowers because they're warmer. Did you know that? We want our young people to be like sunflowers. The truth is, I want old people to be like sunflowers, but our emphasis will be the youth today. To see them get up early every morning and say, where is my Savior? And then follow him all day long, go back to sleep the next day, and be in a position to start it all over again. You've heard the comedians talk, haven't you, that say, if your kids are having trouble sleeping at night, Think about the prayer you taught them to say before bedtime. You know the prayer I'm talking about. 
Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Really, do we need to put that in their heads? Kids, you might not make it to morning. But don't worry, Jesus will take care of you. That's not really the emphasis. But what a great way to pray that we would pray that our children would be like sunflowers. Father, that in the morning to come, their face would be turned to you. And that faithfully every day they would follow you throughout the events of the day. Rain or shine, wherever the Savior moves, they follow. What a great picture. The Lord Jesus was pro-children. Now, he was pro-life. And some people say, but wait a minute. Uh, You don't understand. It's a lot more complicated now than it used to be. Well, it's not really. In fact, it's easier now than it's ever been. Because now we know for certain that that tiny little embryo, too small for the eye to see, that it is human. There's no doubt about it. They've been able to go down and and, and, and test that and and be able to see. And they say, that is a unique human being. In the simplest little physical form, it's a human being. And scientists have decided without any hesitation that it is alive. It is growing and it is human. Should you protect something like that, somebody like that? Well, I know you have bad days with your kids, and you might have serious thoughts about doing some terrible things, but the truth is what keeps you from doing it is, one, you know they're human, right? Two, you know they're growing. You would never get upset and be rid of a child at any stage. Bible says you don't do it in the pre-birth stage. No, no. Children are gifts. They are treasures. They are to be valued above anything else because Jesus said, listen, this, this little child, the father hears and sees what's going on. The angels of this child, we don't know what that means exactly, but the... <coughs> But the angels watch over that child. What a tremendous story the Lord gives us. He goes on. (coughs) Excuse me. Now we're in chapter 17. We've just stepped back a little bit to get the the preface of it. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, There will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow waits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. (coughs) Remember years ago I told you I was taking medication that made me prone to, to cry? I lied to you. I really wasn't taking any any medication. I just cried a lot back then, and I still do periodically now. And some of it's Christian's fault. Yes. How would would you feel better if we picked on Christian? Let's show hands. Oh, hands are up everywhere. Kristen says, "Have you seen this video on America Got Talent? Of the, I mean, it's a lady who was young." practicing the violin, loved the violin, was in a terrible truck accident, lost her arm. And the video starts, and here is this one-armed girl, young mother, playing the organ beautifully. And I lost every bit of my manhood with Christian standing right there. Isn't that beautiful? And I'm going, (laughs) yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, after, after Kristen didn't show me that first video, well, it's because of you. It's still your fault. Because, because she showed me the one of the autistic child singing and playing the piano, and after she left, over on the sidebar, 
was the other one. Hey, let's just get it set right now. Daniel, you're with me, aren't you? It's Kristen's fault. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron showed it to me. Is it Aaron's fault? Yes, it's Aaron's fault. Well, anyway, better take some medication from my memory. But anyway, I do apologize. I am taking some medication and it seems to be a side effect of that. But getting back to our story, if we could ever do that. <clears throat> Jesus says, this is a big deal. How you view children and how you treat children and how you care for them. It goes without saying that one of the things that we want to be known for in our church is we want to be known as a church where we value children, where we will spend any amount of money that is necessary to take care of our children. We don't do that to grow a church. <clears throat> we do that because this is the heart of our Savior, that young people would grow up and make decisions early in their life, and that they would follow the Lord all the days of their life. <clears throat> this week I heard someone give this testimony. I've heard it before, so have you. If I had my life to live all over again, I would have started with the Lord. Because he's done so much for me as an adult I only wish I had started young, young, young as a small child. There are some very disturbing statistics. Today's youth in our society. And when I first read these, I thought, how discouraging. And then I realized I'm reading them the wrong way. <clears throat> During the basketball game, somebody gets up and they don't say... Well, the player at the free throw line has missed 38% of his shots. They don't say it that way. They say the positive, don't they? The man getting up to bat has struck out over 70% of the time. We don't say that. We say, no, he's batting a 248. Sometimes when we read these statistics, we look at our young people and we think, they're all terrible. No, we've got some young people in our church who are outstanding. Oh, I mean, they're young, they're inexperienced, they've made their mistakes. How many has been on that side of an issue? But we have young people, we have watched them, we have many now that we are watching, and as they grow, as we see them follow the Savior, the Son of Righteousness, on a daily basis, we need to celebrate that. So here's how we read these statistics. <clears throat> you see the source on these. These are probably about 2015. Instead of saying three quarters of U.S. high school students have drunk alcohol, used other drugs, and smoked cigarettes, instead think about this. One fourth never have. How many people play basketball? Oh, millions. How many will be playing in the NBA Finals? Only a few. And we celebrate the few. We rejoice at their success. So rather than read it three quarters, let's read it as one fourth of U.S. high school students have never had alcohol or used drugs, smoked cigarettes. Instead of two thirds of high school students have taken more than one substance, which is addictive. Think about this. One-third have not, and the number can increase. That's why we invest in our young people. Do we know that so many of them will fall away? Oh, we know that. We have a long history. This church has been in existence since 1853, and we have seen as a church through those generations, literally thousand walk away and never come back. But why do we keep doing what we're doing? Because there are a few, and our Lord said that there are only a few that respond to the call of the gospel. There will only be a few that will live for the Lord Jesus, and we survive and we thrive for the benefit of those that God will call to himself. What a great work we're a part of. <clears throat> 
The statistics go on. Among high school students, alcohol is the most solely fav favored addictive substance, followed by cigarettes, marijuana, prescription drugs. Uh, <clears throat> if we could just say a word right here. And I understand that there's not a verse in the Bible that says specifically, thou shalt never drink. I wish there was. If there was a verse like that, I would jump on it all day long. There is a verse that says, never get drunk. There's a verse that says that. But like many of you, I have seen the awfulness that alcohol brings into a family. It looks like a friend. For some people, it's a social friend. We need to pray for our young people this season because they won't tell you where it is, but it's happening all over. There will be, there will be parties everywhere for the graduating sing, seniors. And many people will say, alcohol is a social friend. All I do is just drink it once in a while, you know, just to, to have a good time. No, don't, don't believe that. There are many of us who can testify that alcohol was viewed as a friend has become an evil, wicked master. And can I tell you what it does? It steals, it kills, and it destroys because it is the work of the enemy. The addictive nature of that. Well, we've got to go on. That might be a little bit of a hobby horse. But instead of reading that 13% of kids who admitted to have had sexual experience by 15, let's remember that 87% have not. Instead of seeing that <clears throat> 7 in 10 have already had immorality as a part of their life before age 20, think about it as this way. 30% have held the godly standard. <clears throat> Instead of one out of every five, how about four out of five teenage girls are not at risk of an unplanned pregnancy? But the next set of statistics are disturbing. They are difficult because this is not talking about the world at large. This is talking about those young people who grow up in churches like our church, who go to college and they're flooded with the propaganda of that secular machine that nothing you've been taught is true. There's no evidence. It's all make-believe. You have been you only believe it because your parents believe it. Do you still believe in Santa Claus? You know, it goes on and on. These are disturbing statistics because these are young people who have grown up in our church nationwide and this is how they respond in their teen and early adult years. Listen to this. Over 40% say they are not born again. They've been talked out of that to some degree. 35% declare that the Bible has errors, for they don't know, uh, or they don't know if it has errors. 45% say homosexual behavior is not a sin or they don't know if it is a sin. 40% believe gay couples should be allowed to marry and have legal rights. Now, that's a tough issue. I'll mention to you because our family is probably reflective of your extended family. Almost every family now has a situation like this in their extended family a niece, a nephew that's involved in a same-sex relationship or marriage. The Bible says we do not celebrate that. Do we love the individuals? Yes. Are Christians called to be harsh and rude? Never. Do we treat them with genuine affection? Yes. Should they be able to say, the people who love me the most are the people who are against the way I'm living? Yes, that's true for this sin as it is all other sins. But our young people are being pressured by the world they live in. And it's not just the issue of this. The real pressure is, don't believe the Bible to be God's word. Don't 
build your life on this book. There's a better way. And you know what? There is a way that seems better. But guess where it ends? It ends in death and destruction. These are disturbing statistics that our young people growing up in our churches, going through our programs, are turning their back on the word of God. What do we do? <clears throat> we do more. That's what we do. We invest more. We serve more. We give more. We don't criticize. Anybody can do that. We do not have the spiritual gift of criticism. We need people who will serve our young people because the Lord Jesus said, you, you've got to look at this child. You want to know what the kingdom of God is like? It's this kind of humility. It is this kind of innocence. Wherever that is threatened, the church ought to be there protecting the children. <clears throat> Goes on and says 20% say that other books other than the Bible that are inspired by God and 65% believe that if you're a good person, you will go to heaven. Those are Christian kids, or at least we would have called them that, growing up in evangelical churches. Well, let's look at today's observations. A couple of things that are so important. You notice what it said in verse 18, didn't you? <clears throat> Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of God. The proud hypocrite cannot be saved. The proud hypocrite cannot be saved. We're always hearing about the hypocrites. If there's a certain pride that you have that says, I'll do it on my own. I'm better than most of the Christians I know. That doesn't matter one bit. Because Jesus said, unless you are like a little child, unless there's a humility about you, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. No one stands before the cross with their shoulders back and their chin high. If that's the way you stood before the cross, you received nothing from the cross. The way you go before the cross is you drop your head and you go to your knees. And more than that, you go to your face and you say, God, I don't deserve this. That Jesus would have died for me. And now there's, I can't think of anything to do except fall and say thank you. I believe that you died for me, Lord Jesus. I believe that the promises of God are mine because of what you have done. There's no proud Christians. There are sinful Christians who are proud, but there are no good, proud Christians. Humility is what is elevated. Well, what else did we learn? that the church must fight for the kids. Anybody who's against kids, we're against them. Anybody who's for kids, well, we're going to be for them. Our goal is not to help our children become the best athletes. Our goal is to help them know the Savior. We want them to not only know him at an early age, but follow him all the days of their life, just like the sunflower. Every day following the son of righteousness. What else did we learn? Number three, the church must prepare its kids for Christian adulthood. That's why we've selected the curriculum we have in Sunday school. That's why we challenge our young people. Be in a regular routine of reading your Bible and studying. And do you know how best to help in that matter? We don't need your help in buying more books. We need your help, adults, by setting the standard, by not only doing it and being seen in the process of humbling yourself before the Lord on a daily basis, but to speak of what God is doing in your heart. Speak of where you've learned your most important lessons. Speak about what was the one thing you would change if you could. The church must prepare its kids for adulthood. And then there's the warning, and somebody's going to say, it's taken you a long time to develop this thought, because I believe between the two services, this must be the fifth or sixth time I'm talking about this. 
I've just been, when I mow, I mean, these are the kinds of things I think about. <clears throat> I think about, boy, I should have known that. I should have seen the obvious. I need to share this because it's so important. And, and a number of those thoughts are coming into my mind, I suppose, because I'm thinking in terms of another ministry where I can teach a variety of churches in a variety of settings. But here's what I'm going to suggest that you review right now in your own heart. There's a reason why you won't follow the Lord. Perhaps you're here. You're here because it's expected. You need to be. Everybody wants you here. But you really need to look inside and, and ask yourself these questions. Why am I not fully following the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, that's the call. That's the command. Paul said, listen, daily you need to die. You need to place your body on the altar once and for all. You need to surrender. You need to recognize that Jesus is not just the Savior. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Savior and Lord, your master. Every once in a while, when you ask somebody about their story, their love story, they'll say, oh, we went to school together. Oh, we were in the same group of friends. And it's not long until someone says, you know what? And then when I was at this age, when I saw him, I, I saw her, I saw him differently. Then I started thinking, that'd be a nice girl to date. That'd be a nice guy to date. And before long, I thought, I could imagine living with this person for the rest of my life, learning how to be this individual's best friend. The same happens in our relationship with the Lord Jesus the longer we know him, the farther down the road we walk with him, we begin to see, you know what? He's more than just a savior. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've not made him Lord, three quick review of what I've told you a half a dozen times. One, maybe you don't know enough. Maybe it's a head problem. You've not studied enough, you've not read enough, you've not talked to the right people, and we have all kinds of people in our congregation who would love to be a mentor, who would love to teach you what they know. It's a head problem. It's not a heart problem, it's a head problem. You just didn't know. No one ever told you. The second thing, the heart problem. There is something that happened emotionally that is keeping you from doing that. Maybe it's I've been so disappointed by Christians. Maybe it's I, I thought I had all of this once and then it disappeared. It, it left me. It abandoned me. You don't understand the kind of home I was raised in. There's something in the heart that says I don't want what God is offering. His very best gift. I don't want it. Can you imagine any of our seniors who are graduating? Many of you will be at Mark's. Mark, try this and see what kind of a response you get. When they come in and hand you the envelope, you just say, no thanks, no thanks. No, no, I don't really want your envelope. <clears throat> I don't need it. No, please, please stick it right back in your pocket. If you do that, guess what we're going to think? You're nuts. That's what we're going to think because you should want the gifts that we are bringing. We're not forced to, we want to give these seniors gifts. The Lord says, I want to give you my best, why won't you receive it? Well, there's something in your heart. There's something in your heart that's caused you to say, no, no, I don't care how good it is, I don't want it. And then the other problem is your hands. Many times we do not want the best that the Lord offers us because we've already got plans to do things that are wrong. These hands are going to be busy serving us. We're going to do the things that we want to do. We don't want anybody else telling us what we can and can't do. So why have you said no? Is it your head? Is it your heart? Is it your hands? Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? <clears throat> it's the right time to consider the call that God has on your life. It might be you're saying, you know what? 
I don't know anything about what you're talking about, but I, I'm saying yes, Lord, work in my heart. Work in my mind. Help me to see what's really important. Help me to know the truth about the life you've planned for me. It might be that you need to put something at the cross and leave it there. The hurt, the guilt, the shame, the bitterness, just leave it there. You don't need to carry that. No, you can't receive something when your hands are already full. Maybe it's just you're not willing to say yes to him and no to your own selfish desires. You know, nobody can make you do that. Nobody can pressure you into doing that. That's a decision that you need to make. Father, as we come at the end of this service, I am so pleased to see how many people listen and, and are engaged. Lord, we know that there are so many issues that we deal with on a daily basis. But Lord, nothing is more important than these core issues. Do I know the Lord Jesus as my Savior? Am I walking, following him from day to day, every day? Father, I'm asking for our young people in particular, our children, our teenagers, our graduates, our young adults, Lord, that you would convince them that you would prove yourself to be true, that they would say yes every time the challenge is given. Lord, we want the best for them, and we know by sometimes negative experiences that this is the best. So, Father, all of this we ask for as we pray in Jesus' name. Father, we do remember our good brother, Ron Gundrum. Lord, we're not sure what's going on. We know that it's obviously critical, that it's a dangerous time. So, Father, we pray that you would protect him and bring him back to good health. Lord, we understand that there's a day that you, you call any of us home. But, Lord, in, in uh, waiting for that day, this is what we pray for. And we do all of this praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> hey, I've had a change of heart. Preaching that sermon, I've had a change of heart. I agree with Daniel. She's never done anything wrong. <laughs> Want to give a testimony, Daniel? Amen is all we need to say. God bless you guys. Have a great day.